for Jennifer Schulte, better known as Barbecue Becky. 1930s America. The second black migration brings a large population of black folk from the south to California. Suburbanization, redlining, and white flight leave Oakland almost entirely black 2012. Oakland is ranked the third most dangerous city in the nation and the most dangerous city in California. The reports fail to mention that among all of these corpses is the soul of a city that produces far more than just gunfire. Fail to mention the 400,000 hearts beating as one fail to mention one of the most unique places in the world. The role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Tony Cade Bambara. My name is Samuel Getacho, and I'm a spoken word poet and writer from Oakland, California. I take this quote as both inspiration and challenge. I've been writing for as long as I can remember. Ever since I realized that I could create stories just as I love to consume them, I've found a home in the written and spoken word. And I find it fascinating how I'm most at home here in the sky, both everywhere and nowhere all at once. A black boy with an opinion and a heart that's still beating. I began performing poetry when I was 14 years old through the Youth Speaks Teen Poetry Slam, and I never looked back. From there came years of opportunity through organizations like Youth Speaks, Chapter 510, and the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate Program, and so many more. You guys watch out what he's doing next, he's there. I had the chance to learn from some of the most talented poets in Oakland and beyond, and learned how to facilitate open mics and writing workshops to create spaces for other young people in Oakland like the ones that gave me my very first opportunities. I recently closed out my term as 2019 Oakland Youth Poet Laureate. Oakland shaped me in every sense of the word. From my love for the arts and the poetic growth that it fostered from such a young age, to the intrinsic sense of community and concern for others, Oakland taught me everything I know. Everything about this city inspires me. From the incredible artists that live and create here, to the resilient families that persevere through seemingly impossible odds, to the rich and undeniable culture that runs through the veins of these streets, and the history of community organizing and activism. I am unbelievably fortunate to have been able to bear witness to a fraction of the courageous and essential community organizing that activists in Oakland have done for years. From the Black Organizing Project, to People's Breakfast Oakland, to the Anti-Police Terror Project, and so many more. As many in our nation recently began to grapple with the issues of systemic racism and police brutality for the first time, these organizers and activists continued to do the work that they had always done, with or without a spotlight. Work that they will continue to do even after the spotlight passes. In Oakland, the Anti-Police Terror Project recently won an unprecedented victory, with the City Council approving the creation of a task force to redirect half of the Oakland Police Department's budget towards city services and programs that address the root causes of crime. I am honored and grateful to have been able to speak to Kat Brooks, co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project and executive director of the Justice Teams Network, about her work, this unique historical moment, and how we can move forward. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm Samuel. It's so nice to meet you. It's really nice to meet you, too. I'm great. I've been looking forward to this all day. <laughs> great. Me, too. Um, uh, first, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join me today for this conversation. Um, I was first introduced to your work, actually, at a campaign event in 2018 when you were running for mayor. People like this woman put in work to assure that we're not being harassed by police. She's been a leading organizer of the Black Lives Matter movement. She's made the sacrifice to run for the mayor of our beautiful city, Oakland, California. Had to get that love there. And I wasn't old enough to vote at the time. Um, but I remember I ran home and I was like, Mom, you have to vote for Cat Brooks. And I've been following your work and the work of the Anti-Police Terror Project since then. Um, but for those in our audience who aren't familiar with your work, um, could you start by just like introducing yourself and your work with the Anti-Police Terror Project? Sure. Um, so my name is Cat Brooks. I am the co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project. I'm also the executive director of the Justice Teams Network. Thank you so much, Labor, for standing up and standing with Black Lives Matter. 
you're here again in mass, united across race, class, ideology, profession. And our work is focused on eradicating state terror in communities of color. Um, by that, we mean police violence and all of the forms in which it takes place. And we do that in a bunch of different ways. We work very closely with families. We lose loved ones to state violence. We do first responders work and train communities how to respond to incidents of police violence. We do policy at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, we do actions uh, when, when they're called for. And, and we engage in, in robust communications because we're really clear that it's up to us to impact the public debate and we shape the narrative about what public safety actually means and what a society without militarized police and, and mass incarceration could look like, where all of us could truly feel safe. Um, I think when a lot of people hear the terms like abolish the police or defund the police, what they kind of imagine is, you know, lawless anarchy and kind of like giving up on public safety when in reality, like those demands and, and the demands of organizations like the ones you work with, it's not, you know, the forfeiting of public safety. In fact, it's, it's a greater concern for public safety. Um, and so what would you say to members of the community who struggle with imagining a form of public safety that doesn't rely on policing the way we know it? I think the first thing I would say is to look at the data, right? So if, if police and prisons kept us safe, then America should be the safest country in the world because we incarcerate more people than any other country on the planet and more than several countries combined. The vast majority of people that are locked up in our jails and prisons are people that are dealing with mental health crisis, people that are dealing with substance abuse issues, or people that committed what people call crimes of survival, meaning that they were locked out of being able to make a living in the above ground economy, and so they did what they needed to do to eat in the underground economy. And so when we say defund the police, we're not talking about ripping all the money away from policing right this second. We are just talking about taking a significant portion of those dollars and refunding the community with the things that it needs to thrive. So investing in mental health, investing in substance abuse prevention and treatment, investing in alternative responses to things like interpersonal violence, investing in economic opportunity, investing in the root causes of things that actually make communities not safe for anybody, um, as opposed to continuing to this, this cycle of locking up black and brown people um, and then spitting them back out and only to lock them up again. So I, I say often like, I, so police don't solve violent crime. Like I just need people <laughs> to be really clear, like they don't stop violent crime. They respond to violent crime. Exactly. And so I would say like, I would much rather get to the gun before the bullet flies than to be standing there with the mom and she's putting her child in the ground. So I would rather invest in organizations like Community Ready Corps in Oakland or like Courage in Oakland who are on the ground, who are talking to people, who the people trust, who knows when something is gonna bubble up and then they can go address that before we've got somebody dead. You know, and when I was talking during my mayoral, like when I was talking to people in the hills, I was like, would you rather us get to the kid and arrest him after he breaks your window or before he has a need to break your window and take what's inside because he has whatever it is he needs to feed himself, his family, or whatever that day? So to me, it's, it's a flipping of logic. It's, it's about prevention as opposed to punishment. I think that's so fascinating because it's it's something even, you know, I, I have been engaged with these kinds of political issues. I'm 17 now. I've been talking about this since I was 14, you know, writing poems about police brutality since I was 13. From shackles and plantations to handcuffs and prison cells, black folk in this nation are no strangers to the cool kiss of a bullet. And even then, it wasn't until recently that I realized truly how logically flawed our policing system is. Because even in theory, even when it operates at, you know, at its highest integrity, even in, in by design, it, it, it's a Band-Aid solution, right? It does nothing to actually prevent the crime that we're so afraid of. It just shows up after it's happened. And I'm so, I'm so glad that you addressed that. Um, you mentioned a few organizations that are working in Oakland um, to, do, to do that prevention, to, to stop those crimes before they happen. So what could, you know, defunding the police and that, that really essential part of reinvesting in our community look like in Oakland? So hopefully what it will look like, so for folks who don't know, we just had a major win where city council voted to create a task force that's supposed to be made up of our most impacted community members, the folks that sort of bear the brunt of all of the dysfunction of social services and policing in our community, to, to de design what that looks like. For Anti-Police Terror Project, we've designed a model for mental health response that doesn't lead with law enforcement. Up to 70% of the people that are killed nationally by police are in the middle of a mental health crisis. So if we could just stop doing that, if we could stop sending a badge and gun and said, send care and compassion, we'd save thousands of lives. It looks like investing in, in street teams, right? Folks that are of the community and from the community that the community trusts trust to deal with intercommunal violence, 
It looks like reexamining whether or not we need police to do traffic stops. Like, why do you need a badge and the gun to write a ticket? Um, it looks like hopefully eradicating internal affairs. Police officers shouldn't be investigating their own. And we've got a police commission and we need to be empowering and funding them to do that work. Um, so it's really about dissecting all of the things that we don't need law enforcement to do and investing in either existing organizations of which there are many to do that work and or creating new models in partnership with community to do that work. I'm glad you mentioned um, the victory that the Anti-Police Terror Project had recently. Um, something that a lot of people have been concerned about is that this kind of really brunt force momentum isn't at, at such a large scale, isn't necessarily sustainable. So how do you think that the average Oakland citizen who you know may not have year round the time and energy to, to focus on these issues the way that they might have been able to in the past few weeks. What do you think is the best way for the average Oaklander to make sure that things like this task force are carried out properly and that the Oakland City Council or the Oakland Police Department doesn't go back on the commitments that they've made? Truly, folks have got to stay engaged. This is your city. It's your government. They work for you. And if you ignore what's happening, you're going to wake up and you're going to be upset, right? And that's what happens. People look up and like, oh, I didn't know that was happening. Well, this has been happening. Um, you just decided that it wasn't something that you were going to focus on. And, and I get that people are busy and, you know, we've got families and children and school and all sorts of stuff. And you don't have to be focused on all of the issues. Maybe policing isn't your issue. Maybe it's what's happening with our, with our schools, right? Maybe it's the fact that black folks and brown folks in Oakland, like the rest of the country, are getting infected and dying of COVID-19 faster than any other demographic. But whatever it is, like, this is your community. And I firmly believe that the place that we can make the most powerful impact is at the local level. I mean, I'm not saying, please vote federally in November, please, please. That all said, um, locally is where we can really make an impact, right? Locally, you can reach out and touch your elected officials. This is where we can amass power in a very particular way. This is where, you know, 500 people, 200 people showing up to a city council meeting, even virtually, makes a difference. And so carving out that piece of civic engagement for yourself is critical if you're, if you're serious about wanting to build an Oakland that works for everybody. I, I really think that especially the, the way that policing, you know, is targeted, right, I, I think is a really crucial part of the conversation that's missing a lot of the time, right, where people talk about, well, you know, black people commit more crimes or black, their black neighborhoods have higher crime rates. And, and, it, and what it, a lot of people don't realize, and even something that I wasn't able to articulate for a really long time was, it's the crime that's being reported is the crime that we're seeing in these statistics, right? And the crime that's being reported is the crime that the police are present for, and the police are present in Black communities. And so then by definition, you're only going to get those crimes reported. Um, but I also think that it ties into race-based capitalism. I think it ties into class so integrally in a way that we, again, don't talk about when we kind of isolate it to, to just the system of identity politics. And then we talk about, you know, Black capitalism and Black business and Black excellence is the way that we work out of this mess when in fact, it's it's very inherently tied up in class. And, you know, we know that the biggest indicator of public safety is not the rate of policing, but rather the amount of wealth and resources that a particular neighborhood or, or, or area has. What do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about the intersections of race and class when it comes to public safety? If neighborhoods are resourced with the things that they need to thrive, if, they, if we can eat and we can clothe our children and we can keep a roof over our head and um, uh, 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 roofs that are fit for human beings over our head um, and keep the lights on and the water bill on and we can afford to send our children to college and we can afford to transport ourselves when we need to transport ourselves, you eliminate the vast majority of so-called crime. And I, and I don't even like that word because I can guarantee you if I needed to feed my daughter and I was locked out of being able to do so, I promise you, that I'm gonna figure out how to do it. And then we wanna throw people in prison for trying to survive. I, I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that that kind of drive of necessity, right? And I think I, I recently graduated from Oakland Unified School District. I went to Oakland Public Schools my entire life. Um, and thank you, very weird time to graduate. Um, but I think, you yeah. know, <laughs> I, I like to think of it as, as the protests were my graduation party, so it's, looking on the bright side there. But I think, you know, going through the Oakland public school system, 
it was, you know, this constant cycle of being told that we didn't have enough money for things, right? There was a period my junior year of high school where we had to ask parents to donate paper. You know, there was constant shortages that I've been in classroom where classrooms where there weren't enough desks and students had to either sit on each other's laps or stand. I've been, you know, in classrooms where there wasn't a, that, you know, the teacher ended up having to either quit or was sick for a period of time and they just didn't have a substitute teacher. So we just sat in an empty room. Right. And it's, it was super stark for me then to experience the protests, to go up against a police barricade and see that in a city that tells me that, you know, my schools can't afford paper, every single cop in front of me is outfitted with riot gear like they're in the military. And I think, you know, you mentioned earlier Oakland being the most progressive, supposedly being the most progressive city in in the country, but, and, and you know, we have a mayor currently that, you know, on the national scale has been lauded for her stance on Oakland being a sanctuary city and and for, you know, Oakland being supposedly so progressive in our politics. But then we have this disconnect, right, where we have a city and a government that is supposedly so progressive, but then the way that we see the wealth distribution and what we choose to invest in, and even the the inequities that we see in housing and, and in areas like North Oakland and Rockridge compared to a city with one of the highest homeless populations in the country, where do you think the disconnect is between the politics that we claim to have, the politics that, you know, we're, we're seen as having nationwide, um, and then and the actual practice of those realities in, in our city? I think the politics of Oakland sit in the hearts and the souls of the people. It sits in the hearts and the souls of the folks that take the streets and who do the art and who make culture here, right, and do protest here, who are living in the legacy of the Black Panther Party. We are, I think, the most progressive city um, in the country, but not because of who's sitting in office, because of who is in the streets and who's holding those who sit in office accountable. I think, I, I, I don't think we do our research. I don't think we, we pay close enough attention to, to what's happening. And I think we can feel really good and, and say, oh, well, my mayor, you know, standing up to Donald Trump, but, but what is your mayor doing about the 8,000 people that are sleeping on the streets every single night? You know, even amongst the COVID pandemic, we were supposed to put these people in hotel rooms. And they're still sleeping on the streets. And don't talk to me about cost because FEMA is going to reimburse the 75% of the cost. So it's not about money. It's about will. It's about who does and does not matter. We have to pay attention. We have to be engaged in something. You can't just leave it to activists on the ground and organizers and figure everything's going to be all right because that's just not the time we're living in. There are, you know, so many people who come and ask me. There are people who are asking this question on social media all over the place. How do I get involved? How do I support, right? And, and that's, you know... I think one of the what for me one of the the biggest flaws that I saw with the current resurgence was like this kind of sense of disorganization and people not knowing who to listen to and what to follow and where to get engaged people who were all of a sudden like you know black square no black square on my Instagram people who were you know eight can't wait eight to abolish and which one do I go to right you've said again and again we have to stay engaged and people have to pay closer attention where do you think is the best outlet for you know the, again the average oakland citizen who's new to these things um to get engaged and to to learn and, and start following this work yeah so the first thing i would say is is political education matters right reading matters read angela davis read george jackson read friends fanon read 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 and as i studied i started to bloom to question authority, to challenge my teachers, to push back the narrative. Diversify your news sources, right? Don't just watch CNN and MSNBC and Fox News. Diversify your news sources. Um, plug my show, right? Listen to KPFA, listen to Upfront, listen, um, listen to, to, to conservative talk radio. Like, read and listen and get yourself politically grounded. Study past movements. Study the Black Panther Party. Don't, they weren't just about parades and guns and leather jackets. and, and the, the, No, right? They, they ran programs. Understand how the reason why we have school lunches and school breakfasts is because the Black Panther Party was doing the free breakfast program. The second thing is, is engage with vetted organizations. To your point, Eight Can't Wait came out and a bunch of people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then a bunch of established organizations said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. And actually, you need to sit all the way down. Right? The, I mean, the electeds ran with it. Right? Like Libby was like, we're going to implement, are we implementing eight can't wait? We're like, that's not what we want, actually. Right. Um, so, so know who your vetted organizations are. And then figure out what makes your heart sing. So I talk about it all the time, and actually I'm, I'm getting to the point where I don't want to do it either. I was like, not everybody likes tear gas, right? What, are your, what makes your heart sing? And give in that way, because if you're not giving in a way that makes your heart sing, it's not going to be sustainable. 
And then the last thing that I usually say to that is that, you know, and if you can't find a home in the 8,465,322.5 progressive organizations in the Bay Area, start your own. But take all those other steps first, right? And, 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 and figure out, like, maybe it is, you know, like you're, I'm sure you're getting ready to go to college, I imagine, right? young man like yourself, yes. You're gonna be really busy, right? You're gonna be super busy. So what, what, what percentage of your life are you willing to commit to making the world different or better or more like you want it to be? And if that's 1%, that figure out what that 1% looks like. I'm glad you mentioned also that, you know, it's, we, people can't necessarily be going out and getting tear gassed all the time and people have their, you know, their breaking points and people have, you know, a certain level of stamina. Um, definitely for me, there was a period, especially in early June, um, you know, I went to a protest, experienced the tear gas, experienced that environment, continued and continued and continued even after I couldn't continue protesting because of family risks and coronavirus, but then even from home was just constantly consuming news, constantly consuming updates from my friends who were on the ground. And it kind of was like a three week period where I was just going and going and going and going and donating and posting and writing and da 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 da. And I kind of hit a wall, right? And people talk about burnout and you know, I could have logically explained to you all of the different intricacies of burnout perfectly, but here I was, you know, kind of ignoring the signs of it in myself. Um, and I, I guess as somebody who has been doing this for years and years and years, how do you make sure that you are still sustaining yourself? How do you discipline yourself and, and make sure that you are giving the appropriate amount of your life and of your force to, to the work that you do? I've given my entire life to, to this. Uh, it, it, out, with the exception of my art. Um, and, and even then, you know, the the movement stole a, a lot of years where I gave a lot of years where I could have been making art to being on the streets. Um, my mentor, uh, Dr. Ayodele and Zinga says that when, you know, before she took her first breath, God whispered in her ear, make art. And I've added that. I said, God whispered in my left ear, make art, and in my right ear, make revolution. And so it's just what I feel like I've been called to do. And I'm surrounded by people who live their lives that way as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm hoping this, this next generation, the generation behind me, <laughs> does a much better job of taking care of themselves and their families. Because I, I don't believe you have to sacrifice your whole life for this thing. It's just sort of the way it played out for my generation and much even more so for the generations before us, right? Where they literally lost everything to the point where some of them are sitting in prison to this day for doing, you know, not much more than what we, we do every single day um, in terms of fighting for black life. So um, drink water, work out, hang out with my kid. Um, yeah, and try to, you know, limit bad habits. Try. You know, I, I always struggle with balancing. For me, it's my poetry and my writing. I always struggle with balancing how much, you know, work on and focus on contributing to that and and then how much tangible contribution i'm making to actual movement work and i'm i always kind of struggle with taking too much time for one and then feeling guilty about it or taking too much time for the other and neglecting one and how do you and then and then there's also people who say you know who who kind of debate or negate the importance of art in revolution and i and what are your thoughts on that and how to how to both balance the two and use use it as effectively as possible because there's also you know a good amount of art that does uphold the status quo right there is art that does endorse capitalism and and kind of striking a balance of making sure that the art that you create is intentional and and also creates tangible change as well yeah, so whoever those people are that, that don't think art is movement building, you know, get them some of Mary Baraka and some Marvin X and some, <laughs> um, some, some of the other brilliant um, folks that were part of the Black arts movement. And, and people often talk about the Black arts movement as being separate than the Black power movement. But the reality is that the Black arts movement was the fuel for the Black power movement, right? It was the soundtrack. It was how um, the message was communicated to the masses. And so for me and my work, now as an artist, it's almost all around social justice. It's all about movement building. You know, I, I do work by Black playwrights and for Black people, um, or I do work that is going to impact the public debate or force white folks to have particular conversations about Blackness and, and force white folks to sit in a room and, and hear about Natasha McKenna, who was tased to death in 2015 while she was in the middle of a schizophrenic episode, right, that forces conversation, people that maybe hate to hear me when I'm like on the bull 
bullhorn or on the speakers. I'm like, I can't deal with all of that. But if I can get you in a 99 seat black box theater, I can have a whole nother conversation with you in a whole nother kind of way. Demonized, glorified, feared, and rejected. No matter. The work moved forward with a single-minded focus on freedom. It gives you fuel, right, then to go right, right? I'm sure you had a sh you had a, I'm sure you had a bunch of things <laughs> to write about post the, the, those three weeks that you spent in the streets, right? Um, post watching the George Floyd video, post plenty inside of you, and then you just be sure you let it out. As you mentioned earlier, sometimes you use your art, you know, to talk to white people. Um, and I think one of the one of the most interesting things for me to watch throughout all of this has been seeing white people grapple with how to talk about this, who to ask, and like, you know, and 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 kind of this sense of how guilty they feel like they need to feel for certain things. Um, what would you say to white Oaklanders in particular about what the best way that they can contribute to this movement is? Yeah, so so a, a few things. Um, one is to check out groups like Surge, Showing Up for Racial Justice, or Community Ready Corps, Accomplices and Allies. If you are new to Oakland, please be very clear about the space that you are taking up and the ways in which you are changing the social fabric of the city in a way that might not actually be beneficial for the people that were here first. I'm not a native. Um, I'm not a native Oaklander. Um, been here more than a hot minute and, and have contributed, you know, my, my, my fair share. But that, that house that you're buying in East Oakland for $800,000, right? There was most likely a black family that lived in there that no longer could be here anymore. And so then to me, the price you pay for getting to come be in this beautiful city is that you stand in solidarity with the folks that are doing the work to keep Oakland actually Oakland. That means that you take leadership from black folks or brown folks or poor folks or unhoused folks um, and, and you support what they ask you to support and you do it selflessly. That means if you have wealth and resources that you're redistributing those funds to communities that, that need them. That means that you're using your, your white privilege um, to call out um, racism or inequitable practice in the city. It means that you don't use the police as a weapon um, because there's somebody walking in your neighborhood that that you don't recognize, but was probably there before you were. And, and for those of you, you know, for, for white folks and white people, like I've been here 30, 40 years, okay. Well, then you stayed here for a reason. And it's still your job to weaponize that. And if you've been able to stay here, and there are multiple generations of Oakland, black Oaklanders and black, brown Oaklanders that haven't been able to stay here, ask yourself why that is and what you can do to make it better and make it right. It's not about guilt. It's about stepping up and doing your part. For me, one thing that I struggle with a lot of the time, I'm a little bit of a pessimist, right? Um, and so I see, you know, a lot of people talk about how hopeful they are or how exciting, you know, a protest might be. And for me, I kind of, there's this voice in the back of my head of I'm always telling myself not to get too excited or too invested. And in, in, in how much faith do you have that the resurgence of the, this movement that we've seen in recent months will have lasting effects and, and will actually create create the change that we need from the first african that was kidnapped and dropped on these shores we've been resisting all right so for 400 plus years we've been resisting so there's this continuum of resistance right from from then to now um and it's always ebbed and flowed this latest resurgence of the movement is actually for me starts in 2009 i think for the planet starts in 2009 with the struggle for justice for oscar grant and the three-year protracted struggle that we had in the city that rippled across internationally that during arab spring there were people in egypt with signs that said i am oscar grant right each flow produces something and so i'm very clear that without oscar grant there was no ferguson without ferguson there was no black lives matter without black lives matter there, there's there's not this moment now now this moment right now is about extraction this is about okay we've got your attention now we, we didn't have to spend all the time that we had to spend before convincing you that policing in america is a problem people are like okay we got that part this is the now what piece and so this is this is when we do things like defund the police and reinvest in community this is when we do things like the black organizing project did and get rid of the ousd police department this is when we build alternative models <clears throat> for response to community crisis that don't need a badge and a gun, right? This, this is that. Is it going to fix it all? Absolutely not. Are the police going to still kill unarmed Black women, men, and people? Absolutely. For sure. That's going to happen until we completely transform and, and, and redo 
the way in which we police black and brown and indigenous bodies in this country. Will it make it a little bit better? Or maybe there'll be one less Natasha McKenna, one less Miles Hall, one less Steven Taylor. Yes. Yes. What makes you the most hopeful now? Y'all. Y'all, my daughter, you, watching y'all out there on the front lines, y'all. I'm like, we're gonna be all right. You guys are amazing. This this generation of y'all, you know, are, are watching, you know, the 15,000 of you that were out there um, the night the curfew came down. Um, having this conversation with you. I wasn't thinking about this stuff when I was 17, 18, at all. And so to see the, the, the reins that you all are taking, the leadership that's been developed and the passion and the, the strategy and the, the, the thoughtfulness, um, I'm like, okay, bet. I can retire soon. <laughs> I think that's time, but thank you so, so much. Um, this has been beautiful. I learned much. so much. If you ever need anything, please do not hesitate to reach out, email me, whatever, I got you. I think now is, is a time for me to kind of explore, not to bind myself to any kind of particular path. And that not only is that the best thing for myself, but in the long run, it's, it's the best thing that I could do for my community as well. This is kind of the, the piece of advice that I always give whenever people ask me, you know, where do I start? I want to get involved. I want to do something to create changes. I say, find the thing that you are the best at, that you love to do the most, and then find the thing that you care the most about and figure out how to make them work together. That's kind of one side of it. And then my other piece of advice, you're gonna be okay. Like, we do not have to have everything figured out. In this day and age especially, there's this increased pressure to have done a million things by the time you're 18 and already be on track to do X, Y, Z. You don't have to do that to be successful. And the meaning of success is getting redefined and broken down and crumbling before our very eyes right now. So now more than ever, traditional definitions of success are not what you should structure your life around. I think in the future, I'm gonna be much, much more inclined to create in the ways that feel natural instead of the ways that I feel like I owe to the world. Um, and I think, again, like Kat really confirmed for me that and that conversation really confirmed for me that sometimes making the decisions that feel the best for me are also the ones that feel best for the community and the world around me. Um, and I think that that's gonna change the way that I approach the opportunities that I pursue and the things that I explore moving forward. And I think that's it for now.